hello. Um, rather a somber mood today and a slight change uh, to what I was going to say. Um, my old friend Baron Blackett uh, passed away last week in a house fire. Uh, he was one of my co-authors along with Alan Wilson who died uh, earlier this year. We, we wrote the Holy Kingdom together so I'm the last of our little triumvirate still here on planet Earth. Um, I'm going to be doing some lectures on this subject, actually quite a lot of lectures on this and related subjects to do with ancient Britain. So it, it's kind of ironic that they're not going to be with us here um, at this time. So our condolences to his family and to his friends up north in Newcastle. Um, but the show must go on. Hello again. Um, my name is Adrian Gilbert and I'd like to welcome you once more to the Invisible College. And we're going to be moving into a new direction. I feel it's now time that we actually addressed um, the elephant in the room, which is the history of Britain. Now you may think that you already know about the history of Britain, you've been taught it in school. Um, well, have you? Have you really? Uh, we think that political correctness is something new, something uh, it's only really happened in the last few years. But actually it goes way back, way, way back. Uh, what's considered correct changes with the times, it changes generation to generation even. Um, but the idea that you want, or uh, they... The elites, whoever they might be, it could be the king, it could be nobility, it could be the church, it could be whoever has the authority to do so. Uh, they always want to instruct the young in ideas and knowledge that fit with their program. Uh, they don't want them to particularly know about things that they disapprove of or that they don't want uh, for political reasons for them to know about. And a major um, item in this respect in Britain is the ancient history of our island. The ancient history formed long before the Romans came here. Even the, the history, the true history of the Saxons, the Saxon invasions, everything really before 1066. 1066, as you probably know, if you, you certainly do if you're British, is the year that the Willem the Conqueror and the Normans invaded England and fought the Battle of Hastings and Harold II, the uh, English king, was killed with an arrow through his eye um, and William had himself crowned and took over total control of, of England. He had a bit of resistance up north but mostly he was able to just step into the shoes uh, England was probably the most organised state in Europe at the time. As a unified state, it had everything set up. It was uh, pr very prosperous, and that's why the Normans wanted it, of course. Um, all they had to do was remove the nobility uh, and replace them with their own, and remove the senior churchmen and replace them with their own and it had total control over the country in a very short time. Uh, and that, of course, uh, changed English history forever. But things were somewhat different elsewhere, and particularly in Wales. Uh, they, they didn't invade Wales like that. Wales was a, a, a patchwork of separate small kingdoms, and the Welsh spoke a different language. They had their own language of Welsh. And uh, they were the last remnant, really, of the ancient British from before the Roman times. 
and they guarded that uh, independence doggedly, had done for centuries. And it's a very mountainous country, mostly Wales, and not so easy to invade as had England been. So it's, it took a bit of time before the Normans gradually infiltrated, taking a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, you know, taking advantage of civil wars between the different princes in Wales um, to eventually conquer it. And I think it was only in the 14th century or, you know, in, certainly in the 13th century that the last small lordship of Wales, the independent lordship, uh, fell and uh, was brought under the English crown. So it, the very different um, culture, different language, and different history, or different knowledge about history. And that was not politically correct. So that was kind of suppressed, or at least treated as a joke um, in Norman times. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that um, in a little while. But uh, you, you might think that now nowadays people would be more broad-minded, they would uh, want to know more about uh, the, the ancient history of Britain, but for various reasons, um, some of them political, but more cultural, the history remains shrouded in mystery and treated as fake. And that persists right up to our present day. And... One person who really stood against all that was my old friend Alan Wilson. And you may have seen I did an obituary for him some months ago. He died this year and I did an obituary for him. And I want to, in this lecture, um, bring to life a bit of what he represented and why I think he is an important person for understanding the history of our, of our island. Um, I don't agree with everything he wrote or he said or believed, I don't. But he certainly opened a lot of doors and he asked the right questions. And that is what's all important when you're a historian in the first place. Uh, something Alan said, he, he repeated it over and over, was that uh, if you have the wrong scenario of history, yeah, um, you're not going to see the evidence for a different scenario. You're going to look at things in a biased way. You're going to look at it, either fits your scenario or it doesn't. And if it doesn't fit, it's fake. <laughs> or, or you just, you know reinterpret the facts to fit better with what you want to believe because that's your scenario your paradigm you could say and so he, he was very very critical of most of what has been uh, being taught about the ancient history of Britain in our own times but before I go into that I, I go to read you um, the newsletter I sent out yesterday to the college. I, you know I have this college, the Invisible College, and members of that get regular newsletters, at least one a week normally, and they get other uh, videos that you don't see on the open channel here. I do it specifically for them. So I'm going to share with you this um, particular newsletter because it's, it's important and it, it, uh, I put it, I think, quite succinctly here certain ideas and reasons why we have this impasse. And it's actually is changing somewhat now, but certainly throughout the 20th century, um, this was a, a bugbear, well, 19th century as well, actually. Um, it was holding us back. I think things are changing a little bit with some historians and some archaeologists. But... Um, in the main, this is still the, the problem we have. and I'm, So I'm going to read out this newsletter to you, and then I'll talk a bit about what we're going to do with the, this channel and the lectures I'm going to be doing in the near future. I'm not, I want to do a whole series of lectures on this, um, as you'll see. So this was the Invisible College newsletter 
of 17th of December 2023. Hello my friends and fellow invisibles. We've just returned from a short break in Dorset. Yes, I've just come back from holiday. I have to say, despite sometimes iffy weather and flooded roads, it was wonderful. You see, I lived in Dorset for a number of years, mostly in the north of the county, mostly in Shaftesbury actually, or near there. It is a land of rolling hills, at least in places, with many bronze and iron age remains. Mostly these take the form of hill forts, as they used to be called. However, these days it is being realised that these were actually towns of a sort. The people back in the day lived in round houses with thatched roofs. The towns, or forts, were surrounded by multiple circuit walls of earth. Uh, you see these on the, the, on the mountain tops, you can see these embankments. Maiden Castle outside Dorchester is a perfect example of this, and a very large one, I have to say. Um, it is surmised that these were defensive in nature, and I can see this. Their main function, I believe, would have been to prevent ingress by chariots. I don't think I've ever read anyone saying this, but it seems to me that the reason they had all these uh, these uh, valets, valals, whatever they call it, the walls of um, built up round these hill forts and, and multiple layers of them, I think was to stop chariots because they they use chariots a lot, as Julius Caesar attests, and you know you don't want people to be able to ride in on their chariots and slashing and burning. <laughs> Uh, you want to keep them out. And if they're going to try and attack, they've got to do it on foot. And they're easier to shoot that way. <clears throat> um, yes. Uh, you could not drive a chariot in the ditch below the banks or on top of it. Anyone attacking the town would have to do so on foot, as I don't believe horses on their own would have been much use either on the banks. Yeah, a horse galloping up and... You can't just jump over the bank because there's another one there. He's going to hit that. It'd be, your, your horses, are, if you tried to ride them up there over the banks, and that's assuming they didn't have, as they probably did have, other defences on top, um, your horse is probably going to trip up and break a leg. Uh, so you, you've got good defence from that. Uh, so I don't believe horses on their own would have been much use either on their banks. Invariably, there are entrance ways to the towns, but these would have been protected by gates. So there were a large... The gates have long since gone. They are probably made of wood, rotted away, long since gone. But you can see where they were and the entrance ways into these towns. And that would have been guarded with some kind of gates to keep out um, invaders. So many of these forts contain very large spaces within, far more than would have been needed for houses. According to my old friend Alan Wilson, who I'll be talking about quite a lot in coming months, in times of war, the women, children and animals would take refuge in the fort. Meanwhile, the men would go out to meet any opposing army in battle. To do otherwise was considered cowardly. And this is very much in the tradition of the Trojan Wars as described in Homer. You probably read of, at least heard of the Iliad, um, you know, the story of the Trojan War um, and Achilles fighting with Hector and the people coming out and battling and then the, the Trojans go back in their town and the Greeks are on the outside. Um, yeah, it would have resembled that as described in Homer. And curiously, the old name for such hill forts was Troy Towns. So these, these were called Troy Towns um, by the Romans, I suppose. Uh, these, these hill forts with these banks and, and gates as they would have had in those days. Um, though this is all but forgotten in England now. Do you know how many people know that those were called Troy Towns? Very few, I think. Conquest of one of these bastions was mainly to assert control over the surrounding area. However, there was another reason too. Within the enclosures, there were deep pits dug into the chalk. 
Dorset, and indeed much of southern England, is very fertile land, and therefore good for growing grain, as well as raising livestock. The grain would be stored in the pits, which were used as silos. There were also wells in these forts, and no doubt stores of wood for fire too. Very likely the surrounding earth banks would have had protective palisades on top of them, or at least dense hedges. The growing of hedgerows in separate fields is a, to separate fields is a very ancient custom in Britain that goes back to the Stone Age. We still rely on them to this day, both to define ownership of parcels of land and also to prevent livestock from breaking out. Used properly, they are a very effective way of fencing the land. Hedges are living fences and therefore self-repairing. I think that is clear. Uh, I think that, uh, that Britain, uh, maybe Ireland as well, but Britain is the only place in Europe where they really use hedges like this. You go to France, you see these great open fields. They maybe have poplars along the edge, um, but they don't have hedgerows the way we do in Britain. Um, and that goes back to the, the, the culture of the land and going way back into the Stone Age, um, they found traces of, of these. So um, th those uh, they probably had something similar growing on top of these banks. And before we leave that, I just want to add another thing that um, the name in Welsh for an enclosure is clan. It's spelled double L A N. The double L is pronounced. <laughs> something like that, so clan would be what they would call it. Um, and usually that's applied to a church, the enclosure around the church. Alan told me this, um, that the clan would be the enclosure of the church. But you can see that these hill forts would have been clans as well. So this is where you get the Scottish word clan coming from. The, the clan live within that enclosure. It's the house or home of that group, that household. And the household would include the family or the, you know, the enlarged family, but probably retainers as well. Um, and they would, be, they would form the clan, the, the enclosure. And a group of these clans put together would give you a tribe. Um, it sounds to reason. So when you look at the Roman maps of Britain, and I'm going to go into this somewhat in later lectures. Uh, they, they talk about the tribe here, the tribe there, the tribe everywhere. Um, you mustn't think that these were necessarily um, completely different peoples. They weren't. They were all members of the same uh, nation, because a collection of tribes makes up a nation, as you have in ancient Israel, for example, where they had the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, and the nation of Israel, uh, going back to the founding father, who was Jacob, who changed, his name was changed to Israel. Um, they formed the nation of Israel. And it wasn't a place, it was a people. And the same was true of the British, and I, I will be coming to that in later times. Now then, so why am I telling you all this? Well, it is because I think it is time that I started making video programmes on the true history of Britain. This is quite different from what you'll read in history books. My eyes were opened to this by the aforementioned Alan Wilson and his colleague Tony Baron Blackett. Based on their researches, I wrote our co-authored book, The Holy Kingdom, which I have a copy here. You can see. Uh, it's out of print now, but um, it was published by Bantam Press and they're the big publishers. Uh, you heard of cancelling and people getting cancelled, cancelled on YouTube or cancelled on uh, Twitter or whatever. Well, we were cancelled <laughs> with our book. Somebody didn't like it and they didn't like it and had enough influence and power with the publishers to get this book put out of print within 18 months. Nine months for the, the hardback and nine months for the paperback and it was out and pulped. So um, somebody didn't like what we were saying, saying what we were writing. 
And I don't think it was just histori his fellow historians um, getting rid of the opposition, as it were. I think it was probably something more than that. Alan certainly thought that. So anyway, I wrote our co-authored book, The Holy Kingdom. Alan died earlier this year, and you may remember that I made a short video obituary. To say he was an unusually stubborn man is to put it lightly. He needed to be, for he took on the task of ta challenging the entire historical and archaeological establishment. His mission was to recover the true history of Britain, which had been largely jettisoned following the advent of Hanoverian rule, in the early 18th century. You probably know the uh, coming of George I, the first Hanoverian king, after the death of Queen Anne. I think it's, uh, we're talking about 1707, I think, maybe 1708, when he actually came on the throne. Um, but that was the start of the Hanoverian uh, dynasty. Then we had George I, George II, George III, who's famous for having lost America, <laughs> and going nuts for a while, uh, but he did recover from that. And then we had uh, the Prince Regent during the Napoleonic War ta taking over his son, George, taking over as, as Crown Prince while his father was a bit gaga, and eventually he became George the Fourth. And then you have William the Fourth, and then after him you had Queen Victoria. So um, this was a big change in the rulership of Britain with this German dynasty coming from Hanover, uh, yes, they had a, a line leading back uh, to, to uh, the sister of Charles, the, Charles I, um, Elizabeth, uh, who was the Queen of Bohemia, had been for a very short time, who was living in exile, or lived most of her life in exile. But... They were, you know, they were German, and, and George I didn't speak any English at all. I'm not sure if George II did either, or not very much. Um, George III did, and he, they started to become more English then. But uh, that caused a big rumpus and a big change, uh, not least two um, uprisings in Scotland, uh, with the old pretender and the young pretender, the 15 and 45. Uh, that still rumbles on vaguely in the background today, and a lot of what you see about Scottish nationalism and so on harks back to those times. Anyway, carrying on. Britain, which, which had been largely... Uh, uh, his mission was to recover the true history of Britain, which had been largely jettisoned following the advent of Hanoverian rule in the early 18th century. Yes, um, it, it, you know, people before then, they knew this history, or they knew parts of it anyway. And you get bits of it in Shakespeare, even. Uh, King Lear, for instance, he's, he's one of the old British kings, and we'll be talking about them in due course. Um, the 19th century saw, saw the elimination, elimination of the old history books, removing them entirely from the curriculum. And in the 20th century, traditional Welsh history was treated with ridicule. Alan, though he had a career in the management of shipbuilding, he worked for shipbuilders, um, and he was actually involved in settling disputes with the unions and things like that. He was, you know, he was a very active man in his youth, um, a very intelligent guy, I have to say. Um, Shipbuilding was not a total amateur where history is concerned. He had obtained his degree, I think with first-class honours, I think that he told me that, from Cardiff University. He had read two subjects, history and economics, the former including courses on archaeology under Leslie Orcock. I'll be saying a bit more about him in a minute. Cardiff was still a relatively young university at the time. We're talking about the 1950s. Um, early 1950s. Wales having for centuries been denied at academic institutions. Prior to the founding of the University of Wales at Aberystwyth in 1872, that's the first university in Wales, and 1872! 
What was going on before that? Well, a lot. Welshmen had to go to England for their higher education. For centuries, this meant Jesus College, Oxford. There's a particular college the Welsh used to attend. I don't know if other people were at Jesus College, but that was the Welsh College, anyway, uh, in Oxford. Cardiff University began as an offshoot of the University of Wales at Aberystwyth. It seems bizarre and daft. Aberystwyth is a very small town on the coast, miles away. But that was the point, that the Welsh, who had longed to have their own university, put it deliberately miles away in Aberystwyth, because a lot of the people in that area still spoke Welsh. So it's still the University of Wales at Aberystwyth. Cardiff, you would have thought, would have been the obvious place. It's the capital and, and so on. But it was not till much later that um, it got a, uh, uh, its own university. So for centuries, this meant Jesus College, Cardiff University being an offshoot of the University of Wales at Aberystwyth. It became a fully fledged university only in 1972. Today, it is one of the largest universities in Britain. It may even be the largest, I'm not sure. Um, Alan would have attended about 1950, I think. I think actually maybe a little bit after that, 1953 maybe, when it was called the University College of South Wales and Monmouthshire. The archaeology department was largely the creation of Sir Mortimer Wheeler, who after World War I, took up the position of Keeper of Archaeology at the National Museum of Wales. Now, he is a very interesting character, and if you're my kind of age, um, I'm in my 70s now, um, you would have seen him on television in the 1950s and the early 60s. He was, very, he was a sort of pundit. He was one of those people, you know, that they bring on when they wanted to talk about archaeology or history or they had a, a program called what's my line and he was often on that uh, anyway we'll talk about that in a minute um so after world war one took up the position of keeper of archaeology at the national museum of wales this is in cardiff and so he also lectured at the university college of south wales and monmouth yeah well that makes sense wheeler was a scot by birth though brought up in England. He received his university education at UCL, that's University College London. He really knew nothing about Welsh history, and I think cared even less. <laughs> I remember him from my childhood. He was often on BBC television as a pundit, along with other celebrities of the time, such as Gilbert Harding and Isabel Barnett. You, they were sort of famous figures, um, and panel games and things like that as well. Uh, I'm not sure if Alan ever met Mortimer Wheeler, but he certainly was taught by people who were ignorant of Welsh as opposed to English history. Wheeler himself, though really a classicist, was involved in a dig at Roxeter, a Roman period site. Um, yes, that's in Shropshire. Uh, Roxeter is a quite a large Roman city of the time, uh, near the River Severn, the upper reaches of it. Um, Viriconium Conoviorum, I think is its Latin name. Um, we'll talk about that again in the future, but it's, it's an interesting place where you can see ruins and you can see the, sort of the underfloor heating they had in, in Roman sites, and it's a very, very large church they found there as well. Anyway, that's another subject. Um, um, he owed the advancement of his career in this field, that's archaeology, to patronage from Sir Arthur Evans, who's also a classicist and then the most famous British archaeologist of his day. Evans' greatest achievement was the excavation of the ruins of Knossos in Crete, though some today would be critical of the reconstructions he oversaw at that site. Yeah, well, the idea of archaeology was not quite as uh, as it is today. That you mustn't touch, you mustn't change anything, you must bury it again, or you know, don't dig too much, you know, leave some for future time. He excavated the, the huge site in Knossos and had new pillars put up so we could see what it would have looked like at the time. 
and it so looks a bit Disney-ish, you know, and people are, are pretty critical of that, but he did a lot of good work. Um, while at Oxford, uh, he had nearly failed his degree in modern history, so um, uh, Arthur Evans was studying modern history at university, he wasn't studying ancient Welsh texts or um, even Roman history at that time, he was studying modern history. Uh, requiring, it, Nettie failed his degree in modern history, requiring the intervention of his tutor with the then Regius Professor of History, Bishop William Stubbs, that he should instead be given a first. Now, I've written here, I should say here that Allen was highly critical of Stubbs, who lived between 1825 to 1901, as the architect of the new history. Um, he told me that Stubbs had gone through the libraries of Oxford, clearing the shelves of the older history books, including those in Welsh, that did not fit with a new German-style um, history. Or a new German-style historical curriculum that was thenceforth to be taught in schools. So Stubbs changed the curriculum for the schools throughout the country um, and he got rid of the old stuff. He didn't believe it. He said, this, is, this Welsh history is nonsense. It's rubbish. Get rid of it. Don't teach it. We're, we're, we're scientists now. We're going to do things properly. We're going to make history into a science. Uh, you must teach them in, on the German model. The Germans have already done this and we're going to do the same now. Uh, we're going to get rid of all those old books and clear them away from the schools and the libraries. Uh, that's all to be forgotten. Um, so, la, 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 la. yes, so he blamed Stubbs in particular for the suppression of Welsh history and the establishment of a false history of Britain based solely on archaeological theories and not textual record. So that's important to say as well. And we often see archaeologists on uh, TV. We see Time Team and people dig digging away here and they found a bit of crockery and they say, yeah, well, that's Roman period and this must be the Roman layer and there's the Saxon layer there. You know. They don't bother about texts because they haven't got any. <laughs> because those have all been thrown away or at least the, the ones they didn't approve of have been thrown away. So anything pre-Roman, they haven't got a clue about. All they can say is that uh, we're beaker folk or, um, you know, this is Latin kind of pot. Uh, oh, that's interesting. We found a cold cup here. Uh, who might have had that? Well, it must be Stone Age. Uh, the long barrows, they're Stone Age. They, they deal in generalizations. They haven't got any texts to tell them anything about the detail. The who's who and what's what and what was really going on because they've thrown it all in the rubbish bin. So, this new history was based on Latin and Greek history and ignored all the indigenous writings in Welsh. And you might think there are no indigenous writings in Welsh, but I assure you there are. There's huge amounts of it. It's a very well-recorded history. And there's masses of... Uh, archive manuscripts in the British Library, for example, and there are other ones you, you, know, you can find in, in Wales and in other places. And I see even books were published. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so virtually all professors of the new universities in Wales were Oxford trained, and therefore they too knew nothing about Welsh history. A favourite expression of Allen's was that so-and-so often a critic of his work, has the advantage of complete ignorance of the subject. <laughs> That's what Alan would say about these people. He'd say, yeah, he has the complete advantage of the uh, complete ignorance of the subjects. Um, and there's a lot of truth in that. He applied this criticism in particular to Leslie Alcock, who was professor of archaeology when he himself was at Cardiff University in the early 1950s. Alcock was another classicist who had served as Mortimer Wheeler's assistant during a dig at Mahenjo-Daro, that's in Pakistani, in 1966. Uh, sorry, in Mahenjo-Daro. 
1966, he oversaw a major dig, yeah, this is Alcock, at South Cadbury Hill Fort in Somerset. Now, this is one of those, those hill forts we were talking about, these Valley Hill Forts. This prominent earthwork was rumoured to be the true location of King Arthur's Camelot. This was as a result of the itinerary, that's a, a, a journey through, through the land, of John Leyland, antiquary of Henry VIII in 1542. So Henry sent out John Leyland to go and visit all these places. Mostly he wanted to know what was there so he could tax it. But also he wanted, you know, bits of local history. Or, you know, probably someone said to him, oh, yeah, that up there, the Cadbury Castle, South Cadbury, that's Camelot, you know. <laughs> so he wrote that down in his itinerary. There's no mention of this before uh, 1542. Not far away is the village of Queen's Camel. So that proves it, doesn't it? Queen's Camel over there, uh, the, the fort on South Cadbury. Um, over there, uh, it must be Camelot. So anyway, they, uh, uh, come. in fact, as we'll discover in later lectures, what is today Glastonbury Abbey? Oh, I should go back a bit. Not far away is the village of Queen's Campbell, and also only 10 miles away is Glastonbury with its tor. You know, Glastonbury tor, a big grassy hill look uh, you can see for miles around. Leyland wrote that the hill fort had to be the fabled Camelot. In fact, as we will discover in later lectures, what is today Glastonbury Abbey was not even founded till the 10th century during the reign of King Edgar, and that's been proven. Um, there was nothing there in Arthur's times. So this whole, uh, you know, Arthurian Glastonbury, Arthur's buried in Glastonbury Abbey, that's nonsense, it's not. Um, but there was something that was cooked up by the monks uh, in the 12th century after a big fire had destroyed the, uh, uh, the earlier abbey of Edgar and they wanted to build a new one. They, they needed a star figure to bring in pilgrims. They, they hit upon some bones. They said, well, these must be the bones of King Arthur. <laughs> so they put a big tomb there in the middle of the nave and people would come there from miles around all over the country on pilgrimage, and that meant they brought their money with them and brought wealth to the abbey and the town. And Glastonbury is still a place of pilgrimage to this day. It's a lot of other things besides, but um, what it isn't is the final resting place of King Arthur, I can assure you of that. Um, during the dig at South Cadbury, Alcock found evidence of reoccupation of the site during the post-Roman or Arthurian period. He concluded that this muddy hilltop was very likely Arthur's Camelot. And this idea was further publicised by Geoffrey Ash in his best-selling book, The Quest for Arthur's Britain. Now, Geoffrey Ash was, again, not an archaeologist uh, or, or a historian, really. He was a writer, um, but he made this his thing. And he wrote lots of books, you know, on the same basic subject. Um, and promoting this idea of Arthur at, at South Cadbury. So Ash, who died at age 98, only in 2022, that's only last year, was a major proponent that the identity of Arthur uh, as a Roman general called Riothamus. His Arthur lived in this uncomfortable hill fort in Somerset, presumably fighting the Anglo-Saxons, and keeping them away from Glastonbury. He himself moved to Glastonbury where he lived in a little house, once the home of the writer Dion Fortune, who lived from 1890 to 1946. She was a theosophist, occultist, and magician who wrote many books on these subjects. What effect living on the tour in Dion, For Dion Fortune's house had on Ash, I don't know. I met him once on a Burns night in Glastonbury where he sat next to me. He seemed a genial old man, so I don't think he had been sucked into witchcraft. <laughs> However, he certainly believed that Arthur was buried at Glastonbury, which is absolutely not the case. We will discuss where he is 
most likely really buried in the lectures I have planned for the next season of videos I'm going to put up on YouTube. So, I've written here, well, this has turned out rather longer than I expected, but I hope you found it helpful. What I wanted to show you is just how the true history of Wales, and therefore of pre-Saxon Britain as a whole, was altered in the 19th century. This new version of our history was promulgated by highly placed individuals who, though in positions of authority, actually didn't have a clue of what they were talking about. In this way, the glittering figure of King Arthur was reduced from royalty living in a palace to a mere warlord living on a muddy hilltop in the rain. <laughs> I think his memory deserves better than that. For the recovery of his reputation, uh, we have much to thank Alan Wilson. May he rest in peace. So that's the newsletter I sent out yesterday to the members of the college. Now you can join the college uh, at patreon.com slash Adrian G. Gilbert, I think it is. Um, and it'll only cost you five pounds a month. And for that, you get access to the newsletters, you get videos that I don't put up on YouTube, and you have the uh, a nice warm feeling that you're helping this work to progress. You're helping me to keep going with this. Because uh, I've got a lot of other stuff to tell you about. I've been researching these subjects for 50 years, over 50 years. And I've got a lot to talk about. Now, before we go, I'm going to um, mention a couple of other things. Seminal works. The first one da -da 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 -da, is called Geoffrey of Monmouth, The History of the Kings of Britain. Now, if you ever heard or read this book, you'll be saying to yourself now, well, that's a spurious history, and Geoffrey invented it all. Uh, that's what's been spread about ever since, almost since he published it. And it was first published in uh, 1136, um, and it was dedicated to Robert, uh, who was uh, Earl of Gloucester and Lord of Glamorgan. At that time, he was an, an uh, a, a Saxon, not Saxon, he's a Norman lord, uh, and he was the half brother of Matilda, the Empress Matilda. And that there was a, at that time being fought a, um, a war, a civil war between Matilda and her son Henry, who would become Henry II, and Stephen, who had usurped the crown. <laughs> after the death of Henry I, and Henry I was the father uh, of Robert, who was an illegitimate son uh, of Henry I by a Welsh princess. So he was a very, very influential man, this Robert, and Henry I, uh, Henry II owed his crown, really, to the intervention of his uncle uh, and his help in securing the settlement which passed on the crown to Henry II in due course after the death of Stephen. So he was a very influential person and he lived in Glamorgan. And as you'll discover later on, a lot of this history, uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about, concerns Glamorgan. Um, so it's not inconsequential that Geoffrey dedicated his book to uh, you know, Robert of Gloucester, who was the Lord of Glamorgan. But people who say that Geoffrey invented this story of the ancient kings of Britain, it's all nonsense. Uh, well, that's not what he tells us right at the beginning. He tells us that he, um, he was asked by the Archdeacon of Oxford to translate from Welsh into Latin a little book um, that had come into his possession. And uh, he says, I did, I, I'm doing so, and I'm doing it in my own homely style. Uh, well, I can start a bit further down. At a time when I was giving a good deal of attention to such matters, Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, a man skilled in the art of public speaking and well informed about the history of foreign uh, countries presented me with a certain very ancient book 
written in the British language. When he says the British language, he means Welsh. You've got to understand that until modern times, no one ever referred to the English as, as being British. <laughs> they were the English, and the British were the Welsh. Um, the successors, or the last remnant, of the ancient British from Roman times and pre-Roman times. The book, the book, attractively composed in form consecutive and orderly narrative, set out all the deeds of these men, from Brutus, the first king of the Britons, down to Cadwallader, the son of Cadwallo. As Wal at Walter's request, I have taken the trouble to translate the book into Latin, although indeed I have been content with my own expressions and my own homely style, and I have gathered no gaudy flowers of speech in other men's gardens. If I had adorned my page with highly flowing rhetorical figures, I should have been, been bored my readers, for they would have been forced to spend more time in for they would have been forced to spend more time in discovering the meaning of my words than in following the story. Now, people say, well, Geoffrey invented all this, it's just nonsense and there's no book. Um, well, there is a book. Uh, today it's called the Brute to Cilio. A brute, the word brute, B-R-U-T, um, refers to annals written in the ancient language of Britain. It's because the, they would start off with Brutus, Brute, who was the ancestor of the ancient British. Um, just like Aeneas being the ancestor of the Romans, for example. Or, um, uh, I, don't know, I suppose, Jacob being the ancestor of the Israelites. So Brutus was the ancestor of the ancient British. And so they would start off with Brutus and the story of him, and then they'd go through all the, the kings. And over time, different writers would add to it from their own time, you know, and one of the last, or the last to add to this particular text, was Tassilio, who was a known monk, uh, descended from the kings of... of uh, um, Brecon, Brekeniog. He's a, I think he was a son or grandson of uh, uh, Martha Tidville, Martha Tidville. Uh, Tidville was a daughter of Brecon the Brecon. But we'll talk about those things in later times. So he's a known figure living in the 7th century. And he, obviously this old book, a lot of, there was a terrible... Um, plague came to Britain in around that time and a lot of people fled from Britain to Brittany across the, the channel, the Yellow Plague they called it, and many, many people died. Uh, you know, it was a devastating plague. Um, they took their things with them and this old book was obviously one of the things that was taken to Brittany and had only come back to Britain around this time with the Normans and and this book had come into the hands of the Archdeacon, Walter the Archdeacon of Oxford, and he had turned to Geoffrey, who was at least half Welsh, to translate it for him into Latin so he could read it, and other people in the Norman court could read it. And I have to say that this book, um, Geoffrey of Monmouth, caused a huge stir because it, it introduced everyone to King Arthur, who, who features heavily in this book. Um, it was also... There was another book enclosed in as well. There's the the Brutusilio is really the Annals of Wales. And people say, oh, well, the Brutusilio is that what someone did, they, they took the Latin that Geoffrey had written and they translated that back into Welsh. And that's what you got with this so called Brutusilio. Well, I've compared the texts of the two, and it's quite clear to me that. The Brute Cilio predates this because there's certain words that Geoffrey doesn't understand, particularly particular names of things. But when you look in the Brute Cilio and you see what the word was there in the original Welsh and the translation of that into modern English, you see exactly why they were called that. Um, whereas in here, often those names are a complete mystery. You don't know why they, they use those names. So it's clear to me that what he did is he took that old text 
and he made a what do you call a flowery um, translation of it. He he made it more readable, really, instead of being dry text. So and so did this. So and so did that. They went here. They did that. He would make it more flowery. For instance, if there's a wedding, um, they might be saying, and, and so-and-so wed so-and-so. Uh, when he would make it, oh, they were so in love, and she was so beautiful, and then they got married, and it was, well, you know, he would make it more romantic. But he's still telling the same story. Yes, and a bit of a, a spice added to it. Um, and in Arthur's battles, you know, he, was, oh, he killed 50,000 men or whatever. Um, it, the battle took place, but... Maybe it wasn't quite like that. So you have to understand that uh, to dismiss it as just invention is, is wrong. It's based on something much older. And Alan believed, and I agree with him, that the Brutusilio, the bulk of it, was probably written by another monk called Gildas, who was much praised for his learning and his, his knowledge of history and so on. Well, the only book of his to come down to us is his lamentation, you know, um, the destruction of Britain. And you read that, that essay, and it's, oh, it's a real Jeremiah, it's so gloomy, it's, all, it's castigating the nobility for not stepping up and doing what they should be doing and how Britain has been destroyed at the time of um, the takeover by the Saxons. And this would be in the same period of, as Arthur. So... Where did he get this reputation for being this great historian? Well, very likely he wrote the original version of the Brute Tassilio, which was then updated in a later generation by Tassilio. That's what makes sense. And so this, this ancient text has come down to us, and different hands have written different bits at different times. But we have a, a, a precise or a concise narrative we have a genealogies that we can work with and that's another thing Alan taught me very much that if you want to understand history you've got to have a skeleton and the skeleton is the genealogies particularly the royal genealogies so you can put things into context so that was one book I want to, we, we're going to certainly be talking quite a bit about that and the Brutusilio and Geoffrey of Monmouth but there's another book I want to show you here as well, a more modern one. And this is called the Yolo Manuscripts, and it's written by a man, or the son of, it's compiled by the son of a man, uh, Yolo Morganu, he called himself, that was his bardic name. Uh, his, his name uh, was uh, Edward Williams. And he went. He was a stonemason, Edward Williams, who went around Wales. I presume largely in, with his job. You know, someone had some stonework needed doing, and he'd go to, to, to do that work. But when he was on his travels, he would visit uh, the senior families in the area. There might be squires or whatever, and ask them if they had any ancient texts of, you know, the Welsh text, the genealogies, for example, or there might be a list of the saints, or there might be fragments of history and things like this. And then he would copy these out. Um, you know, he'd be given permission to copy these, and he took them away. And he built up a huge archive. And after his death, his son sorted through that archive, and he pulled out what he thought were the most interesting manuscripts and published them in this book. And it's, it's in two halves. The first half of the book is in Welsh. So I have to admit that I can't read Welsh. <laughs> well, I can read it, but I don't understand it. Um, but the second half is the English translations of all that went in the first half. And th these things are annotated, so you can compare words in the Welsh with the English, and you, you can start seeing certain things. So I've worked a lot with this, building up genealogies, making pedigrees of certain families and things like this. Um, and that was very much used uh, when we were doing this book here. Um, we were trying to put things together. Now, again, 
Edward Williams, the other mechanic, he's, he's called a forger. And you, you talk to academics and say, oh, you can't look at that, that he, he's a forger. Well, I don't think that's a fair judgment. I think what you have there is this man, there was his own work he was working on as well. His notebooks, his, you know, his ideas about things he, he's working on. And his son is faced with this huge amount of material. Most of that actually is now in Aberystwyth. Um, in the Library of Wales there. And you, people can go and look at those books. There's, there's volumes of them, of his archive notes in his own longhand. Uh, I don't speak Welsh, so I, it's no use to me, but if you, if you speak Welsh, I would recommend you go and have a look. Um, but he wrote certain poems. They were his own poems. He was a bard. Um, and people say, well, you know, he's a forger. He's wrote, th th these poems weren't ancient poems have been passed down to him there he forged them well he's a bard he's writing poetry <laughs> uh, it's our fault if we don't recognize the difference between his work and the work that, it, that these manuscripts that he copied and i've done a lot of work on this book it's falling apart now unfortunately um and it there are there is a lot of consistency in these various things and all i can say is if if he like jeffrey was inventing all this history. <laughs> the man was a genius, and I don't know where, where he had time to do it, um, given that he was also working and, um, uh, and founding the Bardic movement, uh, the modern Bardic movement, and the, the Gorseth of the Bards. And a lot of things you see in, in I. Steadfords and so on today, people dressing up as Druids and, and reciting poetry and sitting on Bardic, that was all his doing. He revived these things. Um, the other thing I want to say is that up until the, uh, the Cromwellian period, maybe a bit after, uh, there were libraries of Welsh documents in Wales. Um, you can imagine the nobility there, uh, or the old nobility, it was very hard for them to get titles after the Norman invasion. They, the Normans, when they came to England, they just disinherited all the local nobility and put their own people in. And if you weren't one of them, you couldn't even get a knighthood. And the same in Wales. And it wasn't until the time of Henry V that the first knight uh, was given a knighthood in Wales, largely because he was a captain at the Battle of Agincourt and saved the king's life. Uh, he's called the Blue Knight of Gwent. And he lived at Raglan, Raglan Castle. Um, he was the first of the Herberts who lived there. And then the later descendant of his was William Herbert, who became Earl of Pembroke in the time of the Wars of the Roses. And William Herbert built up a huge library of Welsh texts and restarted the Bardic uh, festivals. They used to have them once a year. Uh, where the bars could come recite poetry and the music and dancing and, you know, fun and games. But there was a real purpose as well, that the bars were the ones who kept the genealogies of the nobility and kept alive the Welsh language. That was their job. Uh, so there was a great library there, but unfortunately, at the time of Oliver Cromwell, um, Raglan Castle was held by a royalist. I think he was the Earl of Shrewsbury. Uh, it wasn't Shrewsbury. Um, it wasn't Salisbury. What was it? Uh, Worcester, I think. Uh, hold, or his wife held up there. And Oliver Cromwell's men couldn't, you know, they laid siege and it took months before they eventually surrendered. And after they did, they burnt the castle down and deliberately burnt the library. So all of these texts were lost. Uh, who knows what documents might have been there that we, sh we would love to have today, but out of spite, these things were destroyed. And that happened in other places too. But having said all that, there are still a large number of manuscripts uh, in the British Museum. And I've had a look at some of these. Uh, we listed, listed them in the back here. I, I thought it would be useful for posterity to 
this, uh, at least some of these, uh, in the back here. Uh, yes, yeah, selected bibliography. So we got the bibliography there, and then we got. Manuscript sources. Now, I don't know if you can see that. I'll hold it up. Um, you've got the Catonian manuscripts. You've got the Harleian manuscripts. These are uh, relate to an earlier library where they had, I think, different statues in different places, and they, they, uh, the books that were stored in that place are called either Catonian or Harleian. Um, and so on. But there was a whole load of these manuscripts you can go and have a look at. And I actually had a look at uh, the most famous one is the Harleian 3859, um, known as the Black Book of Carmarthen. And I had a look at that and I had a look at this in the back of that. You've got the genealogies of the, from the wedding festival of Owain, son of Haldar. And that dates back to, I think, the 9th century, 9th century, I think. And Haldar is a great, a famous um, a king of the southwest portion of Wales, David. And Owen was his son. And when his son got married, they compiled these wedding lists. I think there's 32 of them. And they give you an immense amount of information about the the families on, and the intermarriages and so on there. Um, that still exists. Uh, and there's a similar set of genealogies, not quite the same because they're dealing with the uh, ancestors of, of the kings of Brecon. And you'll find that in the Jesus College 20 manuscript. And that's uh, kept in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. So there are these manuscripts around that uh, still exists. They might maybe, if you're not a scholar, they might not let you have a look. But um, a, a, quite a lot of this material is gradually getting put on the internet. If you know what to look for, you can look it up, and you can you can get the uh, the translation of these things in text sometimes. And and uh, certainly the Yolo manuscripts, the English translation, I think that's on the um, on the internet. So we'll be talking about some of this stuff as well. So there is a lot of material around, but it does take work and it takes a lot of, uh, uh, you have to work hard to put things together. So it's, it's like you've been given a jigsaw puzzle and the pieces are all mixed up and it's down to, to you to lay out the pieces of the puzzle to show the picture. And that's what I tried to do with this book. And I've taken the work further, further with another book which we'll be talking about, The Blood of Alvalon. So um, that's what we're going to be dealing with now. I, I don't know for how long, but I, I think it might be a while. We'll be doing lots of lectures on this. Now, if you're not already a member of the college, uh, please consider it. You, it's worth doing, and you'll be helping this work along. It only costs you five pounds a month. Uh, there are other levels as well. Um, I, call, I give these chess piece names. The five pounds a month level is the pawn level. Um, mainly I, the idea of the pawn is that if you're a pawn, you might be humble, but you, you can end up as a queen, can't you, in chess? Um, and there's the knights level, and I see that as like the round table, and I'm giving them specialised lectures uh, for that level. And there's, there's the, um, the earl or rook level, um, that is above that, the baron level, and there's a royal level above that. So you can do higher levels if you want, but it only costs you five pounds a month to join. And I think you'll find it uh, st stimulating and fun, and you'll be helping this work along at the same time. So I leave that with you, and uh, I look forward to talking again. So take care. Bye-bye.